Peace everyone, I'm Masgard here and welcome back to the colored pencil tutorial. Um, today we're going to finish up the ice cream cone. Uh, last week we did the base layers and got a little bit of the values correct. I'm going to be adding a couple colors today. So I think last week I had five colors um, or four colors. No, I had, yeah, I had these four colors. So the four colors that I had last week was the 945, the 1082, 1068, and 939. So I'm going to have those colors uh, here and I'll be working with those. But I'm adding three new colors. And uh, the first color, actually no, I think I used, I used 918 last week as well. So just two new colors. Uh, black, 935, and 1012, which is a uh, jasmine color. And uh, I'm going to start with the black. Hello, Lindy and Kyle. Good to see you. So what I'm going to be doing with the black is just maximizing the values on the ice cream cone. Let me zoom in a little bit on my reference photo here. So there's, there's not a whole lot of black in the reference. Uh, so you're only going to use a tiny bit of it. But it is still there, so we need to use some of it. Hello, Tess and Marcy. Good to see you. So I'm just going to come in here with the black and darken up the values where they need to be. Hope everyone is having a lovely week so far. Almost Friday. We got a holiday here in Poland, so my wife is off work today. So yesterday was technically Friday for us. Got an extra long weekend here. So I'm just adding a little bit like right underneath the ice cream itself. And that's just going to help kind of get the ice cream uh, standing off the cone a little bit. Hello, Gila and Diane, Mr. Fox, Arnie. Happy to see all of you lovely people in chat. I'm just kind of jumping right into the project here. So if you guys have any questions for me, you know that I never get enough questions. So ask away. Just using the black pencil for now. And I'm just gonna get some of the contrast a little bit deeper in parts of the ice cream cone. And then once I, uh, once I finish with the black, what I'll essentially do is kind of another base layer around the light parts. I have that new color, that jasmine color, um, to bring some much needed yellow into the ice cream cone. Right now it's leaning a little bit more towards the red-orange side of things, and I just need to uh, need to pull out some of that, that red and go a little bit more towards the yellow side. Uh, the anticipation is killing you. Well, the anticipation is, uh, is killing me as well. Um, so thank you, thank you for asking. So we put in an offer on the new flat um, to buy it. Uh, as I described on Tuesday, uh, we're trying to buy it. I, I would prefer to buy it rather than to rent it. Um, and uh, essentially, while well, we sat down with the owner and discussed a couple deals, um, I gave her two options and she s seemed really excited about both of them. Uh, very, very intrigued because um, I offered her, essentially, I offered her owner financing option, uh, which is um, better known as rent to own. And um, 
So I gave her I gave her two options with that. She said she's going to calculate some numbers and she's going to get back to us on Monday. So uh, now we're all just waiting together on whether or not she'll accept the deal or she'll come back with a counter offer that um, I might be able to accept. Although there's not a lot of flexibility that I gave her, like the options that I gave her are pretty much set in stone. So not, um, not a whole lot of flexibility there with my offers. Either it's a yes or a no. And, um, but uh, regardless of that, we'll still try to rent the place if we can't, if we can't negotiate a deal on buying it. Oh, good morning, Sneaks. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's like, it, yeah, it's like waiting for the mail. Yeah, it's a long, feels like forever away. I'm, I'm really anticipating uh, her decision. Now I'm adding just a, like a tiny bit of the black on the middle part of the cone. And I'm doing this really, really subtly because um, I don't want the cone to start looking black. I, I want it to remain that tan, like yellowish, orange, tan color. Um, and I'm just, I'm just adding a tiny speck of, of the black in some of the darker parts. Um, so that when I add the brown over top of it, I get like a really deep value, really dark brown color. So as far as my pencil pressure goes, it's very, 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 very light pencil pressure. After, after today's live stream, we'll only have the ice cream itself to do. And I'm hoping uh, that means next week will be the last stream for this project, and then we're going to start a new one. And I had a couple requests for doing um, a male figure drawing. Uh, similar to how I have in my old sketchbook that I showed um, a few weeks back ago when I did my art my art tour live streams and so I have a reference photo a really nice reference photo and um, so we'll probably do a project like that and it will be more of a monochromatic project in the sense that I'll just be using black white and brown so it would be somewhat monochromatic in nature, but not entirely. I guess technically it'd be like trichromatic, if I can invent such a description of just using three colors. I think I got the shadows done pretty well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the new color, that Jasmine 1012 color, and I'm just going to bring some yellow into the cone overall. So I'm basically just going to do a whole other base layer over the entire cone to bring out some of the yellows that need to be that need to be there.
I'm going to use this color really lightly because I don't want to turn the ice cream cone yellow. I just need to tone down like the red pink that is in it. So I'll just slowly add this color. Oh, hello, Georgina. Applying this layer of pencil will help smooth out the, uh, the graininess from the previous layers, but uh, in actuality the graininess of the, the pencils aren't really a bad thing on the ice cream cone since it has like a really porous, spongy-like texture anyway. Hello Connie and Carrie, welcome, good to see you. Yeah, the colors of the ice cream cone are starting to look a little bit more natural now. And all we need to do after applying this color is just rework some of the shadows and just soften some of the edges. And then what we need to create is, is more of a, a rounded shape. So what's, um, you know, obviously it's, it's a cone, um, which is the three-dimensional object. Um, so we, we have to have like a subtle gradient that goes like dark over here and then slowly comes to this highlight. So what we'll do is we'll apply some of our darker brown and just kind of darken the, the left side of the cone and, and try to get that kind of... Um, that gradient showing the, the cone shape. Because right now it looks more like a triangle than a cone because it's not very three-dimensional. And we have the light, the main light source over here. We have this bright highlight on this side, but we're, we're lacking the, the general shadow that should be cast on this side. So it's very flat right now. There we go. This this yellow was really, really good color to kind of make the ice cream cone more tan than pink. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use the 1082 color to try to reinforce that three-dimensional cone shape. 
Uh, and essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to really lightly use this color on the left side of the cone and then gradually I'm going to use less of it and let this side be brighter just overall. So essentially I just need to darken the whole left side of the cone with a light layer of this brown. It doesn't need to be significantly darker. Where's, uh, where's all the questions out, everyone? You were asking so many questions on Tuesday, I didn't think, uh, I didn't think I'd be able to stop live streaming. You were asking so many questions. You're awfully quiet today. Trying to make my job harder. Hello, Kay. I'm glad, glad you were able to make the live stream as well. We finally, finally have a, another nice day here in Poland, by the way. The sun's out and it's quite warm. Yesterday, yesterday it was so cold I had to pretty much wear my winter jacket to go outside. It was just absurd. Actually, the last couple days were just so cold. Could barely, could barely take it. Oh, hey, Chrissy, good to see you. Glad you're able to pop in. I know it's getting late there. Always happy to see you in the live streams. Am I going to do an owl one day? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the... Uh, Maybe remind me, try to remind me. I will try to remember, you can try to remind me. Um, so after the next project, we'll, we'll do an owl in colored pencils. Because I'd like to do, I'd like to do an owl. I've never, never done a full owl and I've never done one in colored pencils at all, so. That would be kind of nice. Has the restrictions been lifted? So some of the some of the restrictions have been lifted. Um, a lot of stores have opened up now. Uh, I went to the city center for the first time, and I don't even know how long. Um, was was it Tuesday? Yeah, it was Tuesday. Um, that's when we went and met the owner of the flat, and. Um, Gosh, it was cold. It was cold Tuesday. Um, I could, I, I was f like freezing cold with my winter jacket on. I was sitting there waiting for my wife to get out of work, and I was, I was sitting outside on a bench, um, 
and I could barely take it. It was so cold. I couldn't believe it. I was like, how is this, how is this June? How are we in the middle of June? Well, uh, the first half of June and I am cold being outside in my winter, winter jacket. I was, I just couldn't believe how cold it was. But, uh, I walked around a little bit and there was, there was a lot of people out, um, and plenty of, plenty of stores were opened up. So, uh, it was, it was nice to see at the least, even though it was kind of cold to be outside. It was nice to see people out and about in the world feeling normal. It was great. Now that I've applied a nice, uh, a nice layer over the cone to kind of darken up the left side a little bit, what I'm going to do is, in the little square parts, I'm going to darken those up now. And I'm using the same color. Uh, why do art teachers recommend starting off with still life? I know this is off topic, but I always wanted to know. That's that's an excellent question. That's a really good question, and it's. Uh, I I also recommend starting with with still life. Still life projects are extremely good foundational projects, and it's for several reasons. So. The first reason is that a lot of still life subjects are very easy to draw. Um, if you if you look at fruit, for instance, I mean, if you uh, an apple, an orange, um, um, a banana, uh, grapes, um, lemons, limes, grapefruits, what else? If you if you look at the shapes, with the exception of bananas, I threw those in there, not meaning to. Um, Fruit are essentially just circles, right? Just just a bunch of circles. So the drawing aspect of still life is very simple. You know, just about anybody can draw a circle. And the funny thing is, uh, you don't even want to draw perfect circles when you're doing an apple or an orange or or all of those fruits or vegetables or whatever. Um, so the drawing aspect, very very simple. Now when it comes to um, like doing doing still life with just graphite or monochromatically. Um, a lot of the shapes being that they are spherical uh, in, in the three-dimensional world, you get, you get the widest range of values because you'll have a, you know, a light, you have a dark side, you have a light side, and you get to focus on creating those gradients, which is the foundation of any good uh, piece of work, is, is learning how to work with gradients and replicate gradients on your paper, whether it's with color or monochromatically with graphite. And um, those simple spherical shapes are far less complex than a you know a human face or a hand or any animal that you would see. So part of the part of the reason is drawing wise, very easy. The other part is that the shading part, is also simplified in terms of uh, any other subject that you potentially think think about. Um, so that's another reason. It's it's kind of the foundational subjects that you can work on with pretty much the easiest features. Every all the features are, are relatively s simple. Now, when it comes to like painting or coloring with colored pencils or pastels or whatever. And you're doing still life that is colorful. Uh, you're actually coloring it. And you're not working monochromatically. Uh, you get a wide range of colors, right? You get reds from apples or tomatoes. You get purples and greens and stuff from apples and grapes and limes and all kinds of other fruits and vegetables, whatever it is that you want to do as a still life project. Um, so you get you get a range of colors that are all going to be affected by the light source. So if you're working with an apple, you're going to have like peachy colors from the light side of things, and you have deeper maroons and reds on the on the shadow side of things. Um, 
And then also with those, those types of projects, it's really easy to isolate colors from texture. So if you look at something, if um, for those of you that uh, have never done my Intro to Colored Pencil course, uh, one of the projects that I cover in my Colored Pencil course uh, focuses on a technique that I came up with that I kind of stole from photography. Uh, when it comes to editing portrait, uh, portrait photography, there's this technique in Photoshop called frequency separation. And a frequency separation is essentially you isolate the colors and you isolate the texture. And when you're working, you know, on a portrait and you want people's face to look really smooth, what you do is you, uh, you smooth out the colors while leaving the texture. You want people's skin to still have texture, you know, but maybe their, their skin's just a little uneven. So what you do is you isolate those two layers. And then on the color layer, you can change the colors or you can make them a little bit softer or whatnot. And that will make the person's face just look smoother overall. Well, learning that about learning that in in my experience of photography and photo editing um, it it clicked to this idea to apply the same principle to art and so uh, i go over that in my colored pencil tutorial and i uh, teach you how to color a potato and a potato is not a remarkably uh, fun subject to do however um, it, it follows those same things that I had mentioned about why still life is always recommended because it's easy to draw. A potato can come in uh, all kinds of variety of sh shapes and sizes. And so as far as a drawing skill is needed, you don't need any to draw a potato. You could literally just draw a random oval circular shaped blob. And if you color it like a potato, it's going to look like a potato to anybody that looks at it. And so I cover the techniques of frequency separation um, on that project. And that's, that's another benefit to working on still life is that pretty much every piece of still life that you could do as far as fruits, vegetables go, you, you can do this frequency separation technique and it's really good foundation for understanding the use of colors and then applying texture so you get uh, you get just a, a really, really wide range of technical approaches when you do something like still life. And as I, as I said, the, the benefit of still life in the end is that you don't have to be good at drawing. Because the fruits and vegetables, they can come in a bunch of random sizes. Whereas if you're doing an animal or doing landscapes or doing portraits, your ability to draw is it's it's paramount to the the quality of work you'll be able to produce i mean even if you were to draw you know a poorly shaped pear or whatever um if you color it properly nobody's going to question the shape of your pear cuz pears and apples and all of that stuff can come in really really strange shapes anyway so if you get the coloring aspect right then nobody's going to second guess your drawing and so still life allows you to focus on things outside of the drawing aspect which is why i always you know give the line art for these these uh colored pencil and pastel projects because i'm not teaching you how to draw i'm teaching you how to use pastels and use colored pencils and Drawing is not a huge aspect of coloring. It really isn't. Oh, hello, Janice. Good to see you. Oh, thanks, Chrissy. Yeah, it's, it's starting to look pretty good. Yeah, I think the ice cream cone is starting to look really good. Oh, hey, Mache. Good to see you. Still using that uh, 1082 color, by the way, but I'm I'm gonna switch here. Yeah, I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna bring in a little bit more red browns um, using the 945. This one is more of the orangey reddish brown. 
and I'm going to use this to create some of the texture on the, uh, the lighter parts of the cone. And really, this is nothing but uh, tiny dots and pinholes in the sponginess of the, uh, of the ice cream cone. So in a lot of ways, I have to make the ice cream cone feel uneven and imperfect. So I have to break up like the, the, the perfect square shapes and kind of push it around a little bit and create like a sensation of, of softness uh, and unevenness to the ice cream cone. And a lot of that is just gonna be created by random dots and scribbles um, throughout the lighter sections of the, of the cone. Oh, hey, Sergio, I didn't even see you come in. So anybody else got any questions uh, or topics to discuss? The, the question about still life was a good one. That was, that was something that I always wondered as well. Um, when, I was, when I was getting, in, getting more and more into drawing uh, around, I don't know, my high school days, middle school, high school days, um, I was always kind of wondering why still life was such a popular subject among um, among art teachers teaching their students, like like why they always set up still life projects. And the, you know, the thing about that is, um, when I took my first painting class when I was in college, I just took a an oil in like an introduction to oil painting class. That was the only uh, collegiate level um, art class I ever. I ever took, uh, but the very first thing, well, actually the very first thing we did was actually a landscape, but, um, it was only in black and white and it was just, it was instead of working with color, it was just about learning to work with the paint. But the, the second three or the next three projects were all still life actually. Um, but they were, uh, the, um, the instructor set up just a bunch of fruits and vegetables and in the middle and we were in a circle like this and um, you just painted whichever ones you liked. I painted, um, I think it was a pear and a tomato. Yeah, I think it was a pear and a tomato is what I, I did for my first Still Life project. And my sister actually my sister Lisa, um, she she has that hanging up in her kitchen. She's had that hanging up in her kitchen ever since I did it. So it's been a been a really really long time. She loves my my still life uh, fruits and vegetables. That's what she likes to decorate her kitchen with. So anytime I do like a fruit vegetable classical um, still life, I always like to give her that project. She has. I think my pears that I did in colored pencil as well a long time ago. Um, do I recommend any good books, like just books in general or art books specifically? Because if it's art books, I actually don't have any that I've that I could recommend. I, I don't know if I've ever read any actually. Um, 
But uh, for books in general, oh gosh, I don't even, I don't even know. Um, I have kind of a niche uh, taste in the books that I prefer to read. I, I'm a I'm a big nonfiction reader. I don't I'm not I'm not a big on the you know the fantasy story stuff. Like I've only recently read some nonfiction or some fictional books, um, and a lot of the books that I read in the past were psychology books or history books um, or books on uh, religion and philosophy so not a lot of fiction um, and I think you, you kind of have to be intrigued by such topics to um, to read the books that I read because I mean I'm talking like 11,000, 12,000 page books that are just full of scientific information and very, I, I, I imagine a normal reader would call them very dry. They're not humorous uh, or, or anything like that. They're just very matter of fact. And those are kind of my favorite books. Um, book I, book I, Recent, the last book that I read uh, was a couple weeks ago was uh, was The Fundamentals of Chess by uh, Jose Capablanca, and it was written like a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, a very technical chess book. Uh, the book that I'm reading right now is um, Bobby Fischer's uh, 60 Most Memorable Games which is, again, a very technical chess book. Um, so I don't know if I have too many recommendations. Uh, what has been the most difficult aspect to perfect when it comes to your own artwork? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I think the hardest thing to perfect is your level of patience. Uh, everybody's at a different stage in self-control, uh, self-discipline. I, I take a lot of pride in my, in my self-discipline. Um, and it's always, I've always kind of had like a, a desire to be very self-disciplined. Like if there's something that I want, to do, or if there's something that I don't want to continue doing, um, I've always I've always put a lot of I've always kind of put a lot of pressure on myself to uh, either stop doing the things I don't want to do anymore, or start doing the things that would be beneficial to me. Um, and I've I've always been I've always kind of been able to do exactly what I want to do if I want to do it and stop the things I don't want to do if I don't want to do it. But when it comes to art, uh, the patience thing is still, is still something that I struggle with every now and again. Uh, and that's, I, I would say that's just the hardest part and I, I, I'm nowhere near perfecting it because if I, if perfecting it would imply that I just don't do it anymore. And um, I have not gotten there. In some ways, I'm actually kind of afraid to put any effort or any more effort into perfecting that, because I feel like if I if I perfect my my impatience while working, um, I might not enjoy it as much. I don't know, because I don't know. There's some. I guess there's some aspect of of working that allows me to relax. Like for instance, when I get to a certain stage in the drawing process or coloring process or painting process, whatever, the, cre the creation process, I can just kind of relax and spend all day fine tuning things. And I really like those those periods of time when I'm working. And I don't know if I like occasionally will rush 
to feel like I get to such a stage or, or what. Um, sometimes I'm completely oblivious to it and sometimes I'm okay with it and sometimes I, I despise it. But yeah, as far as perfecting that aspect of creating goes, I'm not sure if I want to. Because I've, I've always told myself, and I, I've, I've said this to myself for at least 15, 16 years now, um, and I always, I always would tell myself that the day I create the perfect piece of work where I look at it and there's not a single thing that I, even trying to critique it that I cannot critique it, um, I will, I'll quit doing art because I don't ever want to, I, I feel like there's, um, there's a infinite progression towards perfection when it comes to my artwork everybody else can feel however they want about their work but for me I feel like I'm always I'm always moving towards this uh, this unachievable perfection in my work and um, I don't actually ever want to get there but it doesn't take away from the fact that I try over and over and over again to to be perfect with the work um, and I, I, I fear that if I spent uh, spent time trying to perfect that that imperfection of uh, losing my patience at time and I got to a point where I know I don't lose my patience ever then I, f I fear that I might accidentally create something that I can't critique that I that I feel like I can't get better at and I don't want to <laughs> plus there's I mean there's just times where I like to draw color paint create without um, without thinking much without trying much and I just kind of do it meditatively instead and a lot of projects come around like that and if I focus on you know not losing my patience then I, that requires that requires an effort that would distract me from the the relaxing times I get or the the therapeutic meditative um, projects that I sometimes get into. That was a really long, long-winded way of answering your question, Sergio. Uh, would I say that the hyper-realistic piece, the most challenging piece of artwork that I finished? No, I don't think so. Because... Uh, my degree of effort there was put more into the amount of time rather than the amount of skill. Um, I knew what it take. I, I, I knew exactly what it was going to take to do the piece. Uh, I was not sure how long it was going to take, but all I knew is that I was going to spend as long as it needed in order to get it to look hyper realistic. <clears throat> oh, hello, Kathy. Um, thank you very much for the compliment. I appreciate it. I didn't see you come into the chat. I was rambling on about perfection. <laughs> Thanks to Sergio's question. Um, and uh, Chandri, good to see you as well. U.S. Grant from Ohio. Well, I'm also from Ohio, so welcome. I don't live there now, obviously, but um, that's where I grew up. All right, let's see here. What do I need to do here? Um, I got a lot of texture in it. Uh, I feel like I need to bring in a little bit, a little bit, tiny bit of contrast so um, I'm gonna switch back to the 1082 and just kind of work in some of these darker areas again some of them just need to be a bit darker
One thing I look forward to once my wife and I move to a bigger flat and I can have a real, a real studio is, is new lighting set up. Oh, I, ca I can't wait for that. It's so painful to work under these lights. Not to mention that it's kind of hard for me to get good lighting for the camera as well when I do the live streams. Because, uh, I mean, it looks pretty bright. It looks, it looks bright enough, but it's still just not well lit. It's just not well lit. And you guys, your, your picture quality suffers because of that. And I don't like that at all. Um, so what I'm saying is setting up my expectations before starting your artwork can influence your arting experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you take on a project that you, uh, you keep telling yourself that you're just going to mess it up, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to get to a point in the ugly stage uh, and the ugly stage always exists. There is no such thing as a creation that does not go through an ugly stage, no matter what it is. Um, and if you if you keep telling yourself that you're going to mess it up, yeah, it's not going to turn out well or whatnot, and that's what you're expecting, that's exactly what you're going to get. Because um, in psychological terms, that's what is called a... Uh, Oh, I just had it, and then I, and then it skipped my brain. Um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, that's what it's called. Uh, that's, and, and you, wa you want to avoid that in everything in life. You want to avoid self-fulfilling prophecies. If you keep telling yourself you're going to fail, and uh, what, what's going to happen is that uh, you're, you're not going to fail because you can't do it. You're going to fail because you're going to give up thinking that you're going to fail anyway. And you're just going to, you're just going to, um, assume that your failure is because you're not good enough. And that's, that's not the case when it comes, to, especially when it comes to, to art. Um, I could take, I could take any person on this planet that says they can't draw a stick figure and I can make them. I can. I can make them create something that they would never imagine that they they would be able to. If I sat there, gave them colored pencils, and they had never even touched a colored pencil before, I could tell them exactly what to do step by step, and they would be able to create something that they never th thought possible. Because it doesn't take. There is not a magic skill. There's. There's no magic here. There's absolutely no magic. Um, you just need to apply the color where it shows up, and 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 I'll take the time necessary to get it to show up the way that it's it's supposed to. Um, one of the things, like if you look if you look at your drawing, you look at your painting or whatever, and something when you look at it, something just feels wrong. Is because there's something wrong. That that's all there is. So when you look at it, you can see that something's wrong. Now the difference in um, experience and inexperience is being able to identify what is wrong. That's where it, things get difficult. Um, and an experienced artist will be able to look at somebody else's work and tell them what is wrong. An inexperienced artist will struggle when looking at their own work, recognize that there is something wrong, but not know what it is, and then not fix it. And it's, it's only experience. Experience is the only thing that can teach you to look at your work and identify what is wrong when you feel like there's something wrong. And I can't teach somebody that. I can't teach anybody that. Nobody can teach anybody that, actually. Experience is the only, the only education or the only educator that can teach you to identify what is wrong when there is something wrong.
uh, one time long ago someone told you to turn the reference photo upside down. Yeah, that's um, that's that's a fun drawing experience. That's a fun drawing experience. Um, it's really it, it can be useful. It can be useful when when you're learning to draw because uh, the funny thing the the funny thing about drawing and learning to draw is that your brain and your hand they are not the best communicators um, it's kind of it's kind of funny but it's it's very similar to working with color a lot of times when people start working with color especially when it comes to to portraits uh, portraits are uh, like the portraits are the worst anytime somebody deals with skin tone uh, there is an obvious pitfall that so many people fall into and that is they use colors that they think the skin looks like that's that's one of the biggest problems uh, and the same holds true with drawing a lot of times when people are drawing they they ignore what the subject looks like they they think they're paying attention but what they end up doing on paper is drawing what they think the subject looks like and there's this there's so many illusions um if you if you look up optical illusions where you have like uh oh i can maybe create one um maybe yeah, let's just go like this. Like, this is a mild optical illusion. Which pencil is longer? Which which pencil in my hand is longer? Is it the yellow one, the brown one, or the one on the right? The brown one on the right. Like, obviously, you have no idea. But your brain is telling you this pencil is longer, but in reality, it's the shortest one simply because of the, the lineup and you have you have a ton of optical illusions like that with just simple lines very very simple lines um you you have those um those optical illusions where it shows like uh it, it's a three-pronged fork but it only actually has like two prongs or something like that i'm sure you guys have seen them before they're you know plenty of plenty of uh, examples you could go through a hundred examples but what that what those optical illusions teach us about drawing is that uh your eyes are the greatest liars that you have and i had the same kind of conversation on tuesday when i was talking about colors and and how colors create optical illusions that your eyes tell your brain and um it, we fall into them well all of those optical illusions influence how your brain communicates to your hand where to put lines when you're drawing something. And it takes a tremendous amount of effort and tremendous amount of practice in order to, to rewire your brain to, to drawing correctly or accurately. And um, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's a tough thing to get through. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know what else to say there. Um, all right, now that I have I have some of the texture down, I am perfectly comfortable with the amount of texture that I have on the ice cream cone. There's not uh, not really a whole lot else to do, but uh, I need to add some highlights to some of the parts of the cone. So I'm going to use that French gray 10%, the 1068 um, that we used just a tiny bit of last week, and I'm just going to. Uh, put in a few of the highlights around the edges of the uh, the waffle squares and then that will pretty much finish up the ice cream cone i'll just i'll just do this slowly so if you guys have any other fun questions um, for me uh, i'll i'll take on some questions because this i mean i it's only been it's only been about 50 minutes so 
we got plenty of time and I'm just I'm just relaxing here. Uh, would I be able to finish a whole piece working upside down? Yeah, absolutely. Because the only thing that I'm doing here, the only thing that I'm doing right now is shapes and colors. Uh, there's no, there's no hand. There's no ice cream cone. It's just shapes and colors. And whether I turn this sideways, turn it upside down, flip flop it, mirror it, do whatever, all I have to do is put the same colors and the same shapes where they show up. So whether I'm looking at it upside down or backwards or, or whatever, um, just draw the same shapes and colors accurately as I see them. Um, I mean, I've, I've, done, I've done portraits with both hands simultaneously. <clears throat> so drawing upside down would be uh, would probably be easier than that, actually. Now, I, I wonder, you know what would be kind of a fun experiment, experiment is if I were to take, if I, if I was to take a reference photo and let's say I, let's say I, I mirror it. So I, I, I mirror it. So the way that I see it would be the opposite. I wonder if I could reverse mirror it in my head when I draw it. That would be an interesting experiment. Or if I look at a reference photo upside down, but I draw it right side up. I wonder if I'd be able to do that. Because that would be tricky. That would be tricky because at that point I'm not drawing what I see. I'm drawing what's there, but I have to flip it in my head. That would be an interesting experiment. I feel like that would be difficult. <clears throat> Anyways, I'm going to continue on with some of my highlights here. Um, I talk about using Photoshop. Um, I do. I do use Photoshop a lot. Um, and to identify and separate colors, I use Photoshop all the time. In fact, my reference photo for this project, I always have on my monitor inside of Photoshop. And I have a selection of colors that I have pulled from the ice cream cone itself. And I have that separated. And so I, that's how I collect my colors and kind of gauge um, where, like, how many number of colors that I'm going to use for like the base layer. And then what I do is, uh, I, so I, I try to maximize that selection of colors. And from there, once I maximize it, that's where I'll add additional colors, like the oranges and the yellows and in the case of this ice cream cone today, um, to tone it. So I do a base layer and then I do, do toning. And that was really, really clear on the hand. There was a lot of toning that I did on the hand with like the red, the blue, the green, the yellow, and all of that. But those toning colors I do not use Photoshop for. I just use my eyes. I just look at it and be like, there's more red there. There's more yellow there. There's green there. And then I pick those colors where I feel like, um, based on experience, I, I pull the colors out of the set and then I apply them. So there's, there's a limitation to the color selection uh, process that I use in Photoshop. And I recommend that process all the time. I, um, when, when I get a, a student, like a private student or whatever that asks me to help them on a project, 
um, what we'll do, or what I almost always do, is uh, is I will just take their reference photo that they're working on, and um, um, sorry, I was trying to read chat and think about what I wanted to say. What I'll do is I'll take the reference photo that they want to work on, and I'll just pull it into Photoshop. We'll analyze the colors, and I'll talk about the process in which uh, to to color the coloring process there, and discuss all those basically the thought processes that I go through on every project because that's that's the way that I approach every everything that I do. Um, my my art mentor that I had mentioned several several times, Sandy. Um, one of her one of her phrases that she'd always say, and what I kind of stole and used myself, um, because it's it's so true. There's there's no such thing as bad artwork, just bad planning. That's what she would say. And ever since I heard her say that, um, I've I've used that mantra in my own progression in getting better at art. Uh, so when I get my reference photos. I don't just I don't just jump right in. I don't just take a reference photo and be like, yeah, I'm gonna just scribble my sketch real quick and then throw some color at it. Like I, I've I don't know if I've ever done that with colored pencils even a single time. Uh, instead, what I do is I'll spend time looking at the reference photo. I'll just look at it. I'll just be like, I'll, I'll think about each individual element of it. In the case of this project here, I looked at the hand. I ignored the ice cream. I ignored the ice cream cone. I looked at the hand and I just thought, okay, like what's what's going on with the hand? Where is the light source? What can I do? What approach makes would make this this easier on me? Because I'm not looking to uh, to make things harder on myself, and I don't simplify things just to teach it. I simplify things because I want to do it the easy way too. There's no reason to to make it. Um, harder on myself either. I wouldn't I wouldn't change the way that I do it if I wasn't doing a live stream on YouTube. I would still do it pretty much exactly the same. <clears throat> um, uh, the software helps you identify colors by avoiding optical illusions. That's I can see the colors with my naked eye. There's no problem there. I can identify the color um, but what isolating does is allow you to remove the context of the optical illusions that are happening. Because you might look, um, a good example actually is the pastel project that we, we were working on Tuesday when I was doing the arm. I mean, I spent like an hour and a half coloring in the arm. But what was the, what was the first thing for those of you that were there to watch it? What was the very first thing that I did on the arm? I colored in the highlights, right? And what was the color? It was it was blue. It was it was a, a really really cool gray, essentially just a really light blue. Now, if you look at the reference photo, you're not going to look at that highlight and identify that color as blue. I guarantee you, you're just not going to do it. And it's because all of the colors surrounding it convince you that it's white. So, um, isolation. Uh, doesn't allow you to see colors that you can't see, but it'll, it removes the context of the optical illusion. And there's, there's old school methods for this. Um, what, what the old masters used to do is they would have this tool, uh, when they were painting from life, what they would do is they would have this like, it was like a stick with, um, with like a, a closed ring on one end that you would look through and you'd have like a little lip at the end. And what you'd do is you'd mix the paint to you know, the color that you think is you're seeing. And then you'd put a little bit of paint on the end of the, of the little tool. And then you'd hold that little tool up and you'd kind of look through the viewfinder. And the viewfinder blocks everything outside of it. You know, you just look through. And what you see is a little bit of your paint at the end of the tool. And then what you do is you match it up with your subject, and you te and you and it will help you uh, see whether or not that that paint is the same color as what you're seeing in real life. 
So, I mean, Photoshop is just a more effective way of doing, you know, that same little tool. So, um, I can I can assure you that it, uh, the old masters, um, they used every tool to their advantage to, to get their work done. There's, there's no such thing as cheating. A lot of people want to say, like, tracing is cheating or whatnot. Um, but I can assure you, old masters, they traced the... They traced all kinds of stuff. They they made their life as easy as possible, and they've they've been doing it ever since. Being being a good artist is not doing everything the hardest way. So every every tool use every tool to your advantage, no exceptions. Oh, okay, Chrissy, you have a good night. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Sneaks. Yeah, planning planning is a real, real big part of create of the creating process. I I think planning was one of the most important. Uh, important lessons that I learned in my own art. Because for years and years, uh, when it came to drawing, uh, because most of the time I just, I, I spent the time drawing. Like, uh, I didn't get into colored pencils until about six years ago. I think it was 2014 that I got my, that I first started using colored pencils. Um, and even when I did some of the painting, I did some acrylic painting uh, before that, but not not a whole bunch. I, I think uh, started acrylic painting around 14, so like 17 years ago. Um, but not a whole lot of, of painting. Most of my art experience is just drawing. It just comes from drawing. And uh, I never planned anything. I never planned anything, and I think uh, that probably slowed down my progression. I, I should probably be a lot better at, at drawing than I am, um, and I probably would be if, if I just spent time thinking about what to draw as opposed to um, just, you know, picking up the pencil and then scribbling some things down. And one of the things that I noticed when it came to drawing, when it came to drawing people, because I, I really got into to manga when I was uh, in ninth grade, uh, and so that's when I started picking up that style, that manga style of, of art. And uh, one of the things that really helped me progress in that style was doing really small, quick sketches of, of figures in different poses. And instead of trying to do a full-scale drawing, I would just do a bunch of little, essentially a bunch of little uh, forms uh, in different poses and, and stuff like that and just work real small. And then I would try to expand that out to larger projects. And, and that, that really helped me progress in just proportions and um, like just the way the body looks in different positions and all of that. So even back then, I kind of, or, or looking back, I can kind of see how planning uh, helped me improve. And, and yeah, it is, it is a really important aspect of getting better. Uh, do, 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 did, I, did I miss any other questions? Hopefully I didn't miss anybody's questions. If I did, um, it wasn't on purpose, and you can you can always ask me again. Uh, I'm going to switch to the black here real quick. There's still a few areas that I want to just darken a little bit more before moving on. I'm almost done here. I'm kind of being nitpicky, just making really small, subtle changes. Uh, it, I think it looks pretty good. 
I have the, I have the color just about perfect. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of orange to it here in a minute. The color is almost exactly identical to the reference photo. So, um, just got to bring in some oranges, but I want to bring out some of the contrast a little bit more with the black in just a few spots. And I'll, I'll use the black also to create a few, a uh, few little dots of texture as well since it will show up a little bit better than the brown. Sergio, you ran out of fun questions. That is so unlike you. Somebody else. Somebody else. Anybody else got some fun questions for me? I love it when you guys keep the conversation alive because I'm terrible at it. I'm. I. I you could get me talking all day long if you if you have questions, but as soon as you guys stop asking questions, then I'm like sitting here, not having any idea what to say. Uh, you see art instructors talk about a color having orange when I might not see that in the reference photo. Does that come with experience? Uh, no, I don't think it does. I, I mean, it can. I don't think it's necessary. Um, you know, when... Um, I, I, I love chess, so I'm going to make a chess analogy here. When when I'm when I'm looking at a position on the chessboard and I'm trying to I'm trying to find a move, uh, sometimes the move will just jump right out at me. Like I'll see it instantly, like a nice little tactic or something to to win the game. And then other times I have to sit there and calculate. I have to sit there and be like, okay, if I move here, what my opponent does, maybe that's not the strongest move. What if I go here? And I and I run through several different moves. Um, and I'll go like two or three moves deep, depending on, you know, what the position calls for. Well, when it comes to identifying like the colors of a subject, you essentially have to do the same thing. You just have to look at it. You just have to look at it and, and stop, um, you have to stop looking at it as an observer and start looking at it as an artist because the way an artist looks at a subject is nowhere near the same as as an observer. When when an observer goes into a museum, they will sit there and just look at the painting, and they'll just they'll just be mesmerized by the magnificence of it. An artist, however, will go into a museum and they will they will sit there and squint at the brush strokes. They will sit there and look at the the, the subtle texture of, of, of how something was created or, or something like that. We don't, we don't have the same eyes as non-artists. And so when you look at your reference photo, you have to stop looking at it as an observer and start looking at it as an artist, someone that is going to replicate it. So if, if you're replicating it, you have to understand where the colors are and how they're changing. And that, I mean, you're going to get better at it with experience, just like my chess analogy. I'll get better at calculating with experience. Um, but you don't necessarily need experience. You just need to spend the time looking at it. When I look at the hand of this, of this or looking at the ice cream cone, since I've been spending the last hour looking at it, uh, 
I'll look at, I'll find one color, just find one color and then use that color as kind of like a, a reference point for the next color, the color next to it. And, um, you know, when you try, when you attempt your replication and you look at what you've created so far and you're like, it's pretty close, but it's missing something. Well, just go back and forth until you, until you identify that, that color that's missing. And in the case of mine right now, I need, I know that the color's missed, the color orange is missing. Experience will make you better, but it's not, it's not what, uh, it's not what uh, you need to have in order to identify the color. Just need to spend time. Uh, what was the biggest adjustment for me when I started to live um, from the U.S. to Poland, biggest adjustment was the fact that I couldn't simply go see my family. Like one of the things that, and I guess, kind of driving. Like in the U.S., you you kind of have to have a car. Public transportation is complete garbage in the U.S. Everywhere, even. Even in the cities where public transportation is like the highest quality, it is horrendously bad. Um, and so just getting used to public transportation here was kind of a thing. Um, another thing is like finding stuff. Like Googling is, is, is pointless. It's pointless. Um, and that, that's sometimes a, a frustrating part of living here. Because um, like if I want something in the US, you can just get it. I never realized how easy it is to get stuff in the United States. Remarkably easy. Like, like same day delivery from Amazon is so easy in the US. But in Poland, that doesn't exist. That's not gonna happen. Um, and the variety of stuff, that's another thing. Um, the variety of choice that you have in the United States is overwhelming to say the least. If I, if it was to, to go the other direction, like if my wife were to come live in the United States, I imagine the variety of choice would be overwhelming to her. I, I, I'd have to say that'd be one of the most, uh, frustrating things to deal with is just the variety of choice. Um, whereas here you have far less variety of choice. Like if you want, uh, unless it's uh, ketchup um, or what else? Uh, pickles. Yeah, there's like a billion, there's a billion different choices in pickles. Um, and there's like a million different choices of ketchup. Ketchup, I, I don't even understand how there can be so many choices, but there is so many ketchup choices here um it drives me a little crazy I'm trying to think of what else is kind of kind of goofy with the the number of choices um but yeah just small simple things all right uh, i'm done with the black i gotta bring in a little bit of orange into my uh this orange by the way is what i used last week this is 918 Oh yes, I I agree, Marcy. Yeah, you you can't you can't force the aha moments, and then but but when it does click, when it does click, you're like, what? How did I not realize that? It's so so simple. That is um, that is a constant. That is like the the constant state of existing playing chess, is like when you. Uh, when you play a game and then, you know, you analyze it after the fact and you see this move and you're like, what? How did I miss that move? It's so, 
It's so fantastic. What a good move. But yeah, same thing with uh, just about everything. Those, I mean, those aha moments, they are the best. That's what I live for. I don't, I don't get too many of those um, with art stuff anymore, though. I really don't. It's been, it's, it's been a while since I've had a, an, an art epiphany. Instead, I just try to give you guys as many as possible by sharing everything that I can possibly think of to help you improve with, with your own work. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, Kathy. Yeah, yeah. the The orange is the orange is quite prominent in the uh, uh, in the ice cream cone. Yeah, it's it really sticks out. And once you, it's it's kind of like. Um, uh, sorry again, another another chess analogy. I, I I I shouldn't use chess analogies because there's probably like one or half of you, uh, half of one of you that even would understand the analogy. Let me let me try to think of another analogy. Uh, okay, multiplication tables, right? Um, we all know that the the multiplication of nine is a, a really a really obvious pattern. Or let's keep it simple. Some people might not be that confident with their their nines tables. Um, let's let's go with two, right? Two, four, six, eight, ten, all that stuff. The pattern is the easiest. To, to remember because you simply just uh, skip over all the odd numbers. So really, really easy pattern to see. And uh, so when you, when you see, if you were to see a list of numbers and say it started at 22 and it just goes up by two, you would recognize that it's just multiples of two. Like you would see the pattern and if I were to, if I were to give you five numbers, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, whatever, and I ask you, what's the next number? You're probably just going to be able to know it, right? You're not going to struggle with that pattern. You're going to just recognize it, that it's going up by two, and, and be able to give me the right, the, the next number. Well, identifying color is a lot of the, of the same kind of concept. You you establish an understanding of some of the basic recognizing features of color. Like when you look at a subject and you understand like the, that red usually exists somewhere in this spectrum of, of where the color lies. For instance, skin tones, like red, it's, it's in there somewhere, right? So you can, you can look at it and you can identify those, those, you, excuse me, those unique reds that show up. And uh, so the next time you work on skin, you'll be able to quickly identify those reds. Well, you change the subject, maybe you go to something like uh, grapes, right? And with purple grapes, there's, there's, there's some unique colors that can show up in purple grapes. One of them is fuchsia, really bright, intense fuchsia color. And oftentimes it comes in between the dark black shadows and where the light turns the grapes into that deep purple tone. There's usually a red fuchsia type color in there, super, super bright too. Um, and you might not identify that color right away when you, when you look at uh, black purple grapes. And so in the case of this, uh, this ice cream cone, you probably don't have a lot of experience analyzing the color of ice cream cones. I don't have a lot of experience analyzing the color of ice cream cones, but from my years of experience in identifying color patterns and uh, being able to pinpoint the, the subtleties, identifying the subtleties, uh, eventually you just get so good at it that you, it's all you see. So anytime I look at any picture, I can pinpoint like subtle colors that are interesting. And th th this comes like really in handy when it comes to photography, like if you want to, um, 
you know, you want to learn to be a better photographer. Identifying subtle colors can really help you when it comes to editing your photos and also appreciating them. There, I mean, there is a downside to, there's a, there's a big downside to learning photography is that um, you're going to find it a lot harder to take good pictures because you're going to want to take good pictures. You're going to know what is required of you to take a good picture and you're going to struggle to get good pictures and then you, you just can't be happy with the pictures that you take. You wish that you could take better ones. Um, same, same thing with movies, like when you get into filmography and you understand like the power and storytelling of light and sound and just uh, the camera angle, you know, the shots and all of that. When you start to understand that stuff, it makes it really hard to find good movies. And I can attest to that one a lot because finding a good movie, I was just having this conversation with, uh, with my sisters um, over FaceTime and we were talking about the movie um, uh, Collateral Beauty, right? And uh, I apologize if this feels off topic. It is related to identifying colors. <laughs> but we were talking about the movie Collateral Beauty, and it's, it's, it's a decent movie. I like it. It's, it's got a fun story. Um, if you can call it fun, it's much more dramatic and sad, but it's super depressing story, but it's still, a, it's a good story. Uh, I didn't, fun was probably a, a poor adjective choice there. But anyways, um, I forgot that I had watched it, right? And my sister was like, oh, we watched, uh, or she asked me if I watched it. And I said, I think I watched it, but I couldn't, I couldn't remember if I watched it or I just watched the trailer. But after I watched it, I remembered why I didn't like it. It, or what bothered me about the movie. And there's this one, oh, it's, it's maybe three seconds long. It could be as short as two seconds long. This one two-second part of the movie at the end of it that just, mm, it just, it, it, it ruins it so bad for me. Um, and I don't mean to, uh, to spoiler the movie. Uh, I don't think it's a big spoiler. Essentially, it comes down to a home home video, right? It comes down to a home video part of the movie. And uh, Will Smith's character is swinging his daughter around by her arms, like in circles, you know, like hold on to her arms and he's spinning around in circles. It's a home movie. He is watching the movie. He sees it, right? The camera angle of this home movie miraculously is of the girl's face with her arms outstretched, spinning around in circle. Um, now he's holding his daughter's arms with his two arms, two hands, and he's swinging around in circles. What bothers me so much about that shot is who is holding the camera? Because the, the home movie is one scene of him swinging around, and then it, it jump cuts into uh, that perspective. And the only logical explanation is that he's wearing a chest mount with a camera here. But the question is, how did the camera switch positions? And, it, and it, every time I see it, it's like, why, who, who allowed that to come into the movie? Like who, who let that happen? Nobody, nobody noticed that this camera shot makes zero sense for a home movie. It's literally just somebody shooting a video on their phone, right? And then somehow you get this miraculous camera angle where it's on like a chest mount or something, and it just bothers me to death. Um, but when I pointed that out to my sister, she was like, I would have never realized that. And she said, I'm so glad I don't know the things about film that you know, because how do you ever find a good movie? And I told her it's a curse. Like, if you if you like to watch movies, don't learn anything about filmography. Don't study anything about film or storytelling or any of that stuff because you will never find another good movie. You will be lucky to find two a year for the rest of your life. I promise you. It's so hard. <laughs> Anyways, um, circling back around, all of that is... Uh, just learning those little tidbits of 
pattern recognition so that you can find the subtle colors. And speaking of subtle colors, I'm done applying my subtle color. Uh, the orange is in there, it looks good. I'm done, the ice cream cone's done. Next week we're gonna do the ice cream itself. Um, I'll stop boring you guys. Uh, I, sometimes I just ramble on and on and on and on, but hopefully you guys enjoy it, <laughs> listening to it. You're, you're still here, so apparently you like listening to it. Um, <clears throat> that, was, that was an extremely long-ended way of explaining or expressing the uh, identification of patterns. <laughs> and the consequences of learning to identify those patterns. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, I am done for today, fortunately for all of you. <laughs> and uh, I'll be back on Tuesday. Uh, we'll. Uh, We'll put more work in on our pastel portrait, and um, and then next week we'll finish this project. Next week's will just be all about the ice cream. And it's basically like a, it's basically like gray. It's like gray and touch of tan with a little bit of orange brown in there for the uh, caramel swirl. <clears throat> okay, I'm glad you guys enjoyed the story. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Have a fantastic rest of your Thursday and weekend, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.